I think I broke Unlike Uncle Bonsai, planet. we don't have to pay for this by the inch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have a live recording of them. Penelope, we've made it. I've got a lot to cover, as usual, but this is it, the final chapter. Now, I want to say a couple of things. After this, there'll be one more video. I want to do sort of a, a recap uh, of the whole thing, sort of a, a summary, uh, looking back type video. Also, at the end, I have a special announcement for us. Um, I want to have a party. I want to have an online party and celebrate our Odyssey together. And I'm trying to figure out how to do that. I'd love to hear from you. I'm going to put my email in the uh, in the about section, and you guys can get in touch with me. I have some ideas about it, but I'll cover that in the next video. But let's celebrate our accomplishment. Okay. So enough about that. Let's get on with Penelope. This is a very interesting episode. Now, in the last episode, I got uh, confused. I, I guess that's just something that happens when you have uh, uh, this book to face, a video camera going, no notes on the subject that make uh, real sense, and you have uh, some age happening. All of the above. Check, check, check. Um, I, I tried to explain that the uh, the previous episode, the Ithaca episode, was um, not the last episode, but I, I couldn't get straight in my mind. If it's not the last episode, obviously it's not the last episode. This episode comes after it. So I, I, I couldn't get straight in my mind what I was trying to say. And then I said, well, it's not the... Uh, this is meant to be the last episode, but the other one comes a after it, which didn't make any sense. So it, this is what I meant to say. This chapter, the Penelope episode, was written before the Ithaca chapter was written. So when Joyce finished the Ithaca chapter and put that big period, he was done. He meant that the book was complete. The whole thing was finished. It's not the end of the book, obviously. This chapter is very important, and it was never an afterthought. This chapter was written prior to the Ithaca chapter. So this is the last chapter, but it was written before the second to the last chapter. Okay? So I just I wanted to clarify that. I think that matters, too, because Joyce had Molly's thoughts on his mind let me get confused about this again. He had Molly's thoughts on his mind as he composed the Ithaca chapter. So that what we're going to cover today guided his feeling. I don't think it I I think he knew exactly where this book was going to go, but I think having written this Penelope chapter first guided some of his feeling about the Ithaca chapter, and I think that feeling comes through powerfully in Ithaca. Um, I think this journey through the Ithaca chapter has meant more to me in any of the other uh, 99 other times that I've read this book. Um, it Some of his references really particularly resonated with me, hit me especially hard. As you can see from the telescopes, I, I love astronomy, and his astronomical references really uh, resonated. So there was a lot that really got me. So on to Penelope. He mentions in Ithaca about the new moon, and then we see standing in for the moon is the light in Molly's window. We can think of Molly as 
the moon and all those references to the moon and the effects of the moon. Now, moving on, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, the, the, this subject comes up a lot, the issue of censorship of the book. Now, there's a lot of stuff in this book that are um, censorship uh, worthy, particularly for an early, earlier age. The uh, Nausicaa chapter uh, certainly comes to mind. That always comes up. A lot of people quit the book at that point, that it's filthy garbage. And I want to talk about that in a closing video, in our overview. I want to talk about the issue of censorship and what Joyce was doing here. That it's not filth for filth's sake. And also the, there's, and it applies to this chapter as well, there's always that expression that's, well, it's, it's reality. Well, I don't think everything needs to be portrayed just because it's, it's real. However, in this book, because Bloom is a, a person of the body, I think it's important, you know, the, that he eats and it, his diet is unusual. And I think that he uh, defecates and, and takes pleasure in that tells us a lot about the person. I think each of these references matter. I don't think they're there just for the sake of being there and for the sake of reality. I think these things tell us something. In this particular episode, and this is the episode that got the book banned in the U.S., uh, people were able to put up with an awful lot of stuff. Now, remember, the book was published in serial format, and it got pretty deep. And when it hit this episode, everything kind of broke loose. This is where the censors went wild in the U.S. Now, in, in Britain, there were other issues and other problems. I can only focus on the U.S. The biographies I've read focus mostly on the U.S. There was mostly self-censorship uh, self abroad, meaning publishers wouldn't touch it because they knew it would be problems with the British monarchy, with the government, etc. So the publishers wouldn't, wouldn't take it. He had this problem with Dubliners. He had that same problem with Portrait. People just didn't want to go near it and face the trouble. In the U.S., when they finally got the book published, it's this episode that triggered off the, the problems. Because it's a woman speaking, I don't know. Make your own decision on that. I, I, I don't know. I think her expression is more graphic than some of the other um, portrayals of uh, sexuality. But probably has a lot to do because the words are spoken by a woman. So, Molly's words are what got this book censored. Now, let's start with one of the key points of the book. There are only eight sentences, okay? Now, eight sentences. Take eight, turn it on its side, and you get the symbol for infinity. Okay, now I'm going to put a couple images up, and I'll, I'll put this to remind me to put these images or where to insert them, that the images go here, here, here. I'll find that. Okay, so we have eight sentences. Turn on the side. That's infinity. Now, infinity. Joyce is talking about the infinite nature of woman, womanhood, Go back to some of our early videos about the life and death birth cycle being no matter where you start it, you always cycle around back to the same place. These things are endless. We have the river Liffey, which is a symbol of infinity flowing to the sea, ever flowing. This is ever repeating. The cycle goes on and on. It rains, the river flows to the sea, it evaporates, it goes back. It's endless. And history is endless. And the mother of, of humankind is the woman who perpetuates the infinity of history. And we can see it in the images that I post. Okay, You see the, the eight as the symbol of infinity, and the woman on her side making a figure eight as an infinite creature. Okay, So that, that's, I think, a clever, not super pertinent, but interesting and worth knowing and I like you to have some things that are maybe not covered elsewhere. Now look, 
in this chapter, I'm already at nine minutes, right? And I try to cut it down. I've shot this video now three times and didn't like it and just deleted it. I hope I get it right this time because I want this video to be right. We have two questions. This episode comes down to two questions. They are, after Molly goes through with this hookup with Boylan, how does she feel about that? What's the effect? Okay. The other question is, which is on everybody's mind, is do the Blooms resolve their relationship, get back together, and, and fix things? Those are the two big questions of the chapter. Now, are they answered? Let's take a look. How does Molly feel after her hookup with Boylan? Now, as much as Joyce tries to give us an, a look inside somebody else's mind, we can't do it. We know that that just can't be done. Some of you have left great comments saying that you can't know another person's mind, and you can't. And so here we are trying to get inside Molly's mind through these comments that she makes, her inner monologue, as it were. And Joyce does a pretty good job. Now, Molly is not meant to be every woman. She's meant to be Molly. So she's not symbolizing every woman of all time. There is that infinite nature, but Molly is not representative of every woman. So not every woman is supposed to think the same. He's not telling us that. Bloom has some every man characteristics, but Molly is not meant to be speaking for every woman. All right, though there are some threads that are fairly common. She doesn't speak for everybody, so don't make that mistake. Many commenters say that, that Joyce is trying to make this every woman comment through Molly. Not true. Okay, but what, again, going back, how does she feel after this hookup with Boylan? What does she think? Now, one really smart reader that's been following this has said that Molly needs her own book. I tend to agree. I, it's too bad we don't have it because it would be great insight, but I think that's that's true. In this eight sentences, can we summarize everything that Molly thinks and feels? No, but we can get there. Now, there are a lot of clues to how Molly feels about this hookup with Boylan and how she feels about Boylan. We know that Molly has pain. We know that Molly's in a lot of pain, that she suffered the loss of Rudy as deeply as Leopold. We know that. She says that, gosh, she was crying the whole time. She was finishing up the knitting of the coat, you know, sewing the coat that Rudy was buried in. She wrestled with the decision about whether she should have buried him in the coat or given the coat to some poor family, and she says she couldn't make the decision at the time. She was crying the, the whole time. She obviously was deeply affected by the loss of Rudy, as was Leopold. So we don't want to take this lightly that, you know, Bloom here, it's for 10 years, he's, he's not had relations with Molly, so he's this horrible guy, and she's over it and moved on. She hasn't. You know, we all deal with things in our, in our own way, and I think Molly shut down some aspects. As Bloom shut down some aspects of his life, she shut down some aspects of hers. I think one of the things she shut down was her attachment with children. Now, she said when, when Rudy died, that was it, no more. There would be no more children. Well, that attitude, you can imagine, might have had some effect on Leopold Bloom. You know, there wasn't a lot of uh, great birth control stuff available, and the church doesn't allow any of it to this day. So there would be some effect on their relationship just from that pronouncement, but she felt strongly that that was it for kids. There would be no more kids. And she, she states that in this episode. One must wonder if that 
didn't have some effect on her relationship with their daughter Millie. Now we know that Millie's had a birthday, they sent gifts, she sent a card to Molly and a letter uh, to Leopold. And she notices that, that he got a letter and she got a card. She feels that. She both resents and appreciates Bloom's relationship with Millie. She knows that he's close with his daughter and she's a little bit jealous of that. We can gather that from her thoughts in this episode. But also she knows that the men of Dublin at this time are not particularly good fathers. And so she knows that it's pretty admirable that Bloom is close with Millie and that he is a good father. So there's there's something there. Now, to be thinking about this stuff right after this engagement with Boylan tells me that, you know, if we look at this, there is a sort of yin-yang pull here, that it's not just like, wow, that was great, you know, how can I get out of this mess with this guy so I can go carry on my affair? Uh, it's not like that. There is there's a tug, but there's an awful lot holding that in place, whatever that is, okay? Bloom withdrew. Molly locked down some aspects when they lost Rudy. Now, at Molly's core is a desire, a powerful desire, to be wanted. Molly wants to be wanted. She wants to be wanted. She wants to be admired. She wants to be thought of as attractive. She wants to be desired. She wants to be looked at. And this is very, very important to her. Now, when you look back over her remembrances of these other, you know, girlhead, uh, flings, we can call them uh, relations, uh, relationships, whatever, whatever they may be. That's always at the core, is the way he looked at her, the way he desired her, the way he wanted her. Molly wants to be wanted. That is the core of her personage. She needs to be desired. Now, she makes this quote that a woman needs to be hugged 20 times a day. I think this is an area where men tend to be deficient and she's pointing it out and she's starved for that affection and most of us guys are pretty deficient in that respect and and know it and I mean I won't go anywhere else with that but reality of existence and she's expressing that a need to be desired. Bloom has obviously failed in that. So can we blame Molly for this assignation? No, but I think, you know, Bloom has had his fling for the day in, in a couple of respects. One is he's engaging with this correspondence with Martha Clifford for whatever that gets him. Now he kind of fizzles out on that as, as we see him look at those letters, he kind of gets bored with her as the day goes on and each time he reads it he finds other things that he just he reaches a point where he doesn't even get through the letter he kind of skims it and throws it back in his pocket he gets bored with it when he first gets it he's kind of turned on he's happy to get it and it takes his mind off the circumstance but as the day wears on the her lack of intellectual interest bores him and just generally he's He's just not that turned on by her. We see in Molly a similar kind of pattern with Boylan, that she wants to be desired, she wants to be looked at, and so she, she kind of half undresses and sits on his knee, wanting him to get like turned on and admire and desire her. What's he do? He just He just undresses and let's get to it. And she finds his his behavior boorish. You know, that's not the point with her. She wants him to want it, to want her, to be desired, to look at her, to savor it. She wants to be on show. He wants to satisfy himself. He's 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 there to 
please himself. And she gradually sees that. Now, she doesn't outright state it, but she does say that the guy is just a bore. He's just like, a, it's like doing it with an animal, a lion, she says. It's like a lion. He's just a big, powerful lion that just takes what he wants. So we don't see an emotional satisfaction. Now, she tries to fulfill that fantasy. She tries to look at future assignations with Boylan in a, in a fantasy light, and I'll, I'll come to that in a second, but that never really quite resolves either. Now, let's look at Molly's past uh, relationships. If you go back and study those in this chapter, you'll see that these other guys that have been in Molly's life before she was married, not much happens. So we have this picture of Molly as this real sexual, sexually active person, but she isn't. She was probably a virgin when she married Bloom. The, the other uh, hookups in her life when she was a girl in Gibraltar have to do with touchy-feely stuff and the, and the guy that she pleased into a handkerchief by, by hand. But she declines and refuses these guys that want to get further than that with her. She doesn't allow it. She's not as loose as maybe the mental picture is, and then you go back and look at the details and see that it's, it isn't there. So Molly isn't that loose of a, a person. And so this hookup with Boylan I don't think is as emotionally satisfying as she's seeking, okay? Now, remember that Molly is about being wanted. She wants to be wanted, and I don't think Bloom satisfies that deepest desire. Like like Bloom's encounter with Gertie. Bloom has a completely wrong picture of Gertie. He sees her as the, you know, attractive young hottie on the beach that shows him a little stocking and turns him on and he pleasures himself on the beach and then he's shocked at the reality of her lameness, which hoses his whole idea of outside stuff, outside the marriage relations. He, he's almost repelled by himself, and I think Bloom processes these things in the Circe episode, okay? So we get all his guilts about trying to see stalking in his past relationship with, with Mrs. Breen and uh, his thing with Gertie. We get, we get that, and I think he deals with his, his guilt in Circe. Molly realizes the shortcomings of the fantasy when she, she thinks about with Boylan that they're going to go on this concert tour up to Belfast. And when they're in Belfast, since Bloom is going to be down in Clare because of the anniversary of his father's death, they'll be alone up there. And she thinks about them being together. No one will know and no one will care. And they can actually go out together and be together and go shopping which I think is funny. I just don't see Boylan as the attentive, doting guy that wants to take her shopping. I think it would be, you know, stay in your hotel, there's a concert tonight, I'll pick you up at 6 and drive you to the theater. I don't see him, like, going on picnics at Belfast and then a day of shopping. I think her her fantasy is very distorted with him, and I think she knows it, Okay. What she doesn't know that she fantasizes about is, is she thinks about Stephen because Bloom has told her that Stephen was there and he has the idea that maybe Stephen can teach her some Italian and, uh, you know, play music, all the stuff we talked about in the, in the last episode. And she fantasizes a little about Stephen and she says, oh, he would be so, so young and smooth and clean and, and all these 
sexual things that she would do with him. She's fantasizing. Now, I think it's rather humorous that he's so young and smooth and clean. And yet, Stephen is, we know, hasn't had a bath since last October. So, <laughs> there's another fantasy that's kind of not lined up with reality. And I think Joyce is giving us some brilliant stuff. I mean, he set that up way long ago with Stephen being uh, hydrophobic and he doesn't care to bathe, doesn't like water. And here's Molly fantasizing about how, how wonderful and clean it would be to have this young guy. I mean, I can't imagine how disgusting it'd be to be in a room with Stephen who hasn't bathed in eight months. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the fantasies don't line up with reality. Now, much of that we know. Okay, when I say we, I mean all of us. We all have fantasies of different things, and we know much of those fantasies, and much of our fantasy is not real. But then we are often deluded by our own fantasies, and I think there's a little of both in this. Okay, so coming away from her hookup with Boylan, I don't see any deep emotional attachment there. She enjoyed the release of the day and the rebelliousness of it. However, I don't think an, at an attachment was formed. Now she says that she's looking forward to Monday when he's coming next. But then her uh, menstrual cycle begins and she's on the chamber pot and the flow and then she calculates, you know, this five days and she says, you know, one day, two day, three, you know, he's coming in three days. You know, it's it's Friday now. He'll be there Monday, right? And this won't be over by then. And, you know, most men find it repugnant, she says. Well, though some like it, but she doesn't know about Boylan. In other words, she doesn't know this about him. And what we know about him, I'm guessing that's not going to be his cup of tea. I mean, he's going to like things his way, and anything that's going to inconvenience him isn't going to float his boat. So I think in the in the grand scheme, you know, make of that what you will, but I, I think there are too many signposts saying that this was not a deeply emotionally satisfying day, though physically um, pleasurable and intriguing for Molly emotionally, no. Now the big question. Do the Blooms make it? Can the Blooms repair their relationship? Yes. I say yes. The chapter begins with the word yes. Now look, Joyce has written a most brilliant book ever, probably. He's no fool. He knows at this point your question is, what happens with the blooms? Do they make it? That's the big question that's been on our minds for quite a while here. We know there's a problem. We know where it's going. What we want to know is, can they fix it? Right? Joyce knows this. And the chapter starts out with yes. He's telling us, I believe, yes. Yes. It begins with yes. The chapter ends with yes. There should be no doubt in your mind. I have no doubt in my mind. And I'll tell you why. Joyce knew that would be your question. And I believe strongly that he wants us to come away knowing this. Always there's a little doubt. Kind of like religion. No matter how much faith you have, there's always a little nagging doubt. And I think he wants to give us that as strong a faith as we can have. But he's not going to make it so clear that there's not a lingering doubt. This isn't a fairy tale. Okay? He's writing reality. And it's one day. And in one day, we can't know these people well enough to understand all these dynamics. But I say yes. Now... Joyce had a, a rough spell with Nora. There was a place in their relationship. He had to go back to Ireland for a while, and some of the guys told him that she was 
fooling around with his friends in the early part of their relationship, which just incensed him. And, and guys can be jerks, and somebody planted that seed. And Joyce was a terribly jealous guy, and this just drove him bonkers. And then he started thinking about Nora messing around while he was away because she didn't come back to Ireland with him. And so it, it practically drove him nuts. And he started writing letters, and then she said no, that she wouldn't mess around, and then it's, you know, that stuff is all false. They exchanged some very erotic letters, which we have, and actually their relationship jumped back on track while, while he was away through their letters, which we have. So none of this is conjecture. We, we know it, and as their letters progress, they get more and more intimate and more and more erotic, and she reaches a place where she says yes to some real quirky stuff. He says, oh, I want to do this, and I want to do that, and she says, yes, do it, do it, and he's all turned on, and, and their relationship corrects, and I think that is really at the heart of this episode that Joyce is telling us, yes. Now let's look at our two characters. Bloom and Molly both have their most fond memory on on Hoth Hill when he proposed. They made love, they had a picnic, and he proposed on, on Hoth Hill. That is for both of them their fondest memory. Bloom has thought about this all throughout the day. His his mind kept flashing back to that moment. The chapter ends with Molly thinking about that very moment. Y you can't tell me that her mind on that and his mind on that all day doesn't point to the reaffirmation of their relationship. Now they both went off track today. Uh, things happen. They've had They've had some rough stuff. I have no doubt they fix it. Now there's some little stuff in here that that, that Joyce likes to sort of, you know, you, you put it all together, nail it shut, and then let's go back and seal the cracks with some caulking, right? Molly talks about wanting some new lingerie. Now first she thinks about boiling, and she wishes she had some nicer things. And then she thinks about Stephen and how it'd be nice if she had a, a some nicer semi-transparent house dress and stuff like that and she could flit around the house and turn him on and she even talks about sneaking some uh, the checkbook away from uh, Bloom's drawer and going out and buying this stuff and that'll show him now I think I think that Joyce is trying to tell us something here. We know that Bloom is a very visual guy. He's trying to sneak a look at stocking and he's trying to peep up a dress. He's a very visual guy. That turns him on. I don't think she's going to have to steal that money. And I think, again, they think alike. There, there are so many places where their thinking converges, where she starts thinking about Boylan and you know, his manlyhood and how many times she reached a climax today and how wonderful it was. And you notice that changes as it progresses. It kind of the fantasy gets better and better. But I think these little clues about wanting to be visually appealing and wanting to steal the money uh, to get the lingerie, I don't think she's going to have to steal it. We also have her touching references about Bloom. She loves that he's courteous to old women, even waiters, she says. She likes that about him. In a society that is very class conscious, Bloom is good to everybody, and he goes out of his way to do things for other people. She recognizes that and likes that about him. She likes his intellectual curiosity that he, he would look at poetry, that he would care about Italian, that he would care to have this guy even come there to learn poetry and, and Italian, even though she knows people laugh at him behind his back. She still respects that in him, and she likes that. She's, she likes that he's a nice guy, and she likes that he tries to better himself and be smart and read books, and that he's curious about things. He's dynamic. He's, 
He's a multidimensional person, unlike these drunks. And she even says that the guys of Dublin, they're not going to get their hands on, on her husband. Her husband. She uses those words. They're all out drinking away every dime they have. He brings home the bacon. Bring, uh, Bloom provides for his family. He brings the money home. He's not a drunk. He's a good guy. He's, he's intellectually curious, and he's good to people. And she thinks about all those things. Now, if you're trying to look for justification to get away from somebody, you don't go through that sort of mental process. Okay? Now, what else? Molly likes that Bloom has demanded breakfast in bed. Now, the chapter begins with that, and then it reaches that again at the end. And and at the beginning, she's like, well, look at him demanding that like he's royalty. You know, breakfast in bed, and he wants two fresh eggs. You know, who is he to do that? By the end of the chapter, she's not only planning the breakfast that she's going to bring him, but she's thinking about other meals. She's going to go out and get a nice piece of cod and maybe get some flowers in the house and spruce things up a bit, and the lingerie thing kind of shoots through the mind. Okay, you decide, but I think that I think his assertion is a change, and I think she likes that. I don't think the the rump kiss was as big a deal as some might make of it, though I think it was an expression of affection with Bloom, and that uh, there's also a little clue around that that you can look up. Now, what else do we know? I think one of the most important things that we know is that Bloom is resolved in his feeling about the loss of Rudy. That that very ending part of Circe, where he Stephen's been punched and he's laid out, and Bloom reaches down to help him, and he looks up, and he has the final apparition where he sees Rudy and he looks neat and he's in the nice coat and he's reading Hebrew. He is resolved. Now all the other characters that appear are creepy. They're they're ugly. The the father comes with the claws and the and the yellow streaks down his face. Stephen's mother is is all haggard and deathly. Everybody else is, is awful. Even the, the apparition of Gertie is she's all creepy and, and dirty. By the end we have one appearance and that's Rudy and he's looking good. Alright, so I really believe that's a very strong resolution of Bloom's big issue. Alright, I think at that moment we know He's a changed guy. That resolution completes us in that cycle of infinity. All is well with the world. That's part of life. People die. All of us are going to, right? There are people being born today and people are being buried today. Bloom is resolved and lets go of the emotional chunk, he's healed. The Blooms are not going to have the surrogate son in Stephen. That isn't going to happen. Now a lot of people speculate about that, that you know he runs into him on the street someday and they say come over for dinner and then it, you know I don't believe it. I think Joyce specifically put Stephen fade to black. He walks into the night never to be seen again intentionally. Okay? Why? Joyce is done with him. We have we have the book, the greatest thing to come out of our country in years. One thinks of Homer, right? This is it. The book is done. Stephen was the vehicle for this book. It's done. All right? So that character is over. The Blooms don't need a fantasy. They don't need him hanging around. That, I believe, is the final piece in what tells me 
Yes. Yes, they're resolved. Now, if you have any other doubt, let me quickly give you the quote from Bloom that he lays on the citizen back in the Cyclops episode when the citizen is laying it on him and Bloom says force, hatred, history, all that. That's not life for men and women. Insult and hatred. Everybody knows that it's the very opposite of that that is really life. What, says Alf? Love, says Bloom. So if you think it's trite to have love overcome all, I think that quote from Bloom tells us, no, it isn't. It does, it will, yes. Molly's last thoughts were of that time on Hoth Hill, Bloom's proposal. And she gets gleeful and she says yes. Now do you have any doubt? I don't. They're gonna work it out. It's gonna be okay and it's gonna start, it's already started, but it's really gonna start in the morning. Things are gonna be different. I know they're gonna work it out. I just know it. Yes. 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 So there you have it. You've done it. You've finished uh, one of the most difficult books in literature. One of the most highly rated. Yes. Yes. You did it. And I'm really pleased about our Odyssey. Now look, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that I completed this. I'm still going to make one more video because I'm running too long now and there's some things I want to conclude with, but, you know, I've made mistakes along the way and, and, you know, I didn't get everything right. I hope I made it pleasurable for you. I hope you enjoyed it. If even a handful of people read this great book and get something from it because these videos helped it means a lot to me, and that was all I wanted to accomplish. Amazingly, think about it, it's taken eight months to complete some little what's going on videos of a book that takes place in one day. <laughs> That's how inadequate I am, at least, to try to express this. But I thank you so much for following this odyssey together and these videos will be here hopefully for years and years for for other readers and I'm just I'm proud of what we've accomplished and I thank you for the comments that you've made along the way and your encouragement I'm not an expert I couldn't have done it without you it's, believe me now one announcement I'll wrap this up I want to have a party now, I don't mean a live YouTube thing, because that's kind of dull. All you can do is comment. I want to use my business account for a, a web conference where we can get 25 people anywhere in the world, and we can all meet together. Details to come, so please watch the channel. In the next video, I want to do a summary, and I'll give you the details on our party. But I think it would be fun if we could, if we could pull that off. I don't know if it'll work. We can try. I think it'd be fun to try. It would be fun to talk with you, and I, I just think it'd be neat. So I want to have a party, all right? So what do you think? Do the blooms put it back together? Yes, I have no doubt. Yes. So ask me again, as Molly would say. Yes. 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 Yes.